Are you ready for the main presentation of the night? Yes. We are ready. Yo. All right. Let her rip. Well, our, pre our presenter tonight is, I am pretty sure, the longest term member of the Warren Astronomical Society at this point. Wow. He uh, has been a member of the WASP since 1973. Doug was president and first vice president of the club, editor of the WASP, and led incorporation of the club in 1982. He is an active member of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club, the University Lowbrow Astronomers of Ann Arbor, the Seven Ponds Astronomy Club, the General Motors Astronomy Club. Jeez. Uh, he was one of the founders of the Great Lakes Association of Astronomy Clubs, served as chairman and vice chairman of the Great Lakes region of the Astronomical League, was a member of the uh, Michigan State University Club, and the editor of their Out of Focus newsletter. <laughs> In his professional life, Doug served as an IT and real-time system specialist for 41 years until his recent retirement from Ford Motor Company, and he is now a full-time professional amateur astronomer. <laughs> Without further ado, I give you Doug Bach. Yo! results out of this current system that we have and uh, a little bit about the technical side of it uh, near the end of the presentation. Uh, this picture that you're looking at is uh, a collection of all the scopes that I've had, or most of the scopes that I've had over the 45, 50 years, actually be 50 years now, since uh, 1968, uh, that I've either owned or uh, have access to. One of them is not mine, it's the one in the middle there. At 18 inches up at Boone Hill right now. It actually belongs to Dr. Richard Brenz, one of my cohorts at uh, Boone. Uh, but I, that's the one I get to use when I go up there. I have a question right away. Yeah. What in God's name, how much in God's name did you have to pay for that trust tube? Which one? Second, from the bottom, from the left. Black. Richard Crichton? The RC? Yeah. That's the one we'll be focusing on later in the talk. I'll talk okay. about Okay. The one right under your face, you mean? Yes. It's like yeah, it's the, one, on the one that's covering my lower torso. <laughs> that's the one you're referring to. Yeah, that's a, a 10 inch RC. That's in the system right now. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, in the beginning, 1984, um, I did some shopping around for land out away from Detroit. Uh, we spent two years actually trying to find a place, and uh, it was uh, the place that we ended up moving to was three and a half acres in 1983. The plan was to have no more than a 60 mile drive to work, and I worked in Dearborn, so it happened, it happened to meet that goal. At the time, the sky was dark. Uh, 1983, 84, it was really a, a good sky back then. And then uh, we started the plan for the construction. So the first thing I had to do was go to the Livingston County and show them my plan and get a building permit for two sheds. And that's what they were called, just sheds. And they said, uh, well, we'll give you a permit, but you didn't really need one for a 10 by 10 shed. So and I always said I wanted to be up, up front about the whole thing. I didn't want to go through what Dave Harrington did in Troy. Oh, God. <laughs> so it was issued October 13, 1984. So the first thing you got to do if you're going to build your observatory is you have to lay out where it's going to go and where the pier's going to be. And uh, we started digging away at the pier. The first 18 inches was pretty easy because it was sandy loam. But then 18 inches down, we had hit clay. So we had to pull out the pickaxe 
and start working uh, working the, the ground from that point on. So that hole ends up being about four and a half feet deep, three by three on the side, uh, where we're going to put our uh, our pier. Is that you? No, Did that you? is uh, that is Roger Tanner up in the right hand corner standing there, and that is my uh, uh, ex brother in law John Anderson. He was uh, he's six foot four, so it gives you an idea of how big. <laughs> so. <laughs> so that's 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 the digging of the hole in 1984, and that's uh, the first picture on the left is the southern horizon at the time. So I had 20 acres south of me; I could uh, see forever, pretty much. The next thing we had to do was um, build a, a form for the section that was going to be out of the ground, and also to be able to hang the rebar that we built. Uh, welded together for the eight bolt pattern that we were putting in place. The a bolt pattern is going to be three quarter inch uh, threaded rod uh, where we're going to hook a steel pier to later or any piers that we wanted to in the future. So that's what these pictures are about. We're creating the form, we're lowering in the cage, and the guy in the far right corner there next to my brother. He brought the, the three cubic yards of cement and I said, where am I putting all the cement? Because he couldn't figure out where we were putting it. I says, down in this hole. When he looked, he says, okay, I understand now. <laughs> and I says, whatever you have left over, we're going to put in the pads that are on the west side there, which have a, another eight bolt pad around those. So we poured the cement and uh, did all the, all the form work, smoothing it out. As you can see on the left hand corner, it's the top of the pier there. I put a quarter in there dated 1984 so that we had, uh, so when I get old and forget when I built it, I can go out there and look. <laughs> and uh, the next job is to dig all the holes for the foundation and also for the outriggers. And so we have a two man auger that we're using, again in clay and uh, stones. And uh, the adventure was that it was, we were pushing into November, it was cold out, we're wearing our, our winter coats and we're hitting rocks that are throwing us off into the snow. So we put the 4 by 4s in, built the uh, um, flooring, and bolted it on there. And uh, from that point on, we started working on the walls. The uh, lower walls are 40 inches high. Uh, I wanted to have low horizons for the system that I was putting in at that time. And so uh, this is just as constructing the wall. They're all two by sixes. The four by fours and the four corners came up into the wall, so the, the walls were actually part of the foundational structure in terms of uh, being uh, strong. So they weren't they weren't going to move because the <coughs> four by fours in the ground were in cement. So it was, as they say, it was built like a brick house, uh, over engineered, but that's what we did. Then the uh, upper section had to go on. Uh, I was in, uh, obviously, a younger age and uh, very ambitious to get this project done. So one night, one afternoon, I actually built the upper section myself on the ground on this side of the doors here. Around. And I got built enough, uh, structurally enough, that it, it was rigid enough. I put two by fours down on the east and west walls and slid this structure up on the top. <coughs> Then we are finishing off putting in the trusses that we had to build. And that's the finished product. And that's the system that I put in at the time, a 12 and a half inch up uh, six uh, Newtonian. That's a research grade mead with rotating rings. And that's what I used for observing and astrophotography for uh, a little over a decade. So that was the finished product there. That's your house in the background? Yes, that's my house in the back. The house is up towards the road. As you notice, it's color coordinated. Yeah. Uh, the requirement for my wife was that it had to fit in. So. And then the expansion happened in the mid 90s. Uh, the second observatory we put in was uh, the old Blue Fakes Observatory that he built in the late 70s, early 80s. And then when he moved to Arizona in the 90s, he actually gave that dome to this club. And the club didn't know what to do with it, so I gave him a hundred bucks, bought it off the club, and oh. put it out here. Oh my god. Oh god. A hundred bucks. 
bite. Oh, <laughs> whoa, so, mama! So that 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 dome went over the one of the pads that had a bolt pattern in it, and we put a pier here. It's so like that wood pier here, and then we uh, put um, that, the picture here is Jack Kennedy on the left and Clay Kessler on the right. They were my cohorts in crime in the '90s on these projects. I should say that the original project team was Roger Tanner. Bob Lennings, myself, Ken Kelly, with help from Doug Nell out of the Lowbrows, John Anderson, and a few other people that came out once in a while to help out. So we, uh, in fact, Doug Nell helped build the trench, dig the trench from the house to the observatory, 150 feet of clay with a pickaxe. <laughs> and, um, so he had his Alex 210 inch in there uh, in that dome for several years, and uh, that's what it was used for. Um, with anything that is built out of wood, renovations are a requirement every once in a while, especially on the roof. So in the mid-90s, we had to uh, redo the roof of the Roloff Observatory. That's uh, Jack Kennedy on the left and myself up, up on top, I'm working on that. Then um, another renovation happened in 2012. Well, the re let me finish. The renovation in in, uh, in the 90s led to also uh, another system going in there. I got an LX210 inch that I put into this observatory in uh, 99 for two years. And I actually did a talk uh, about that when I did a remote access telescope talk uh, using that scope back, back in the, quite a few years ago. Uh, so this is kind of like part two. Um, but this is the team in 2012 that did a, the new renovation. What the picture you don't see here is what the observatory looked like before the team showed up. Um, it had been kind of idle for a little while and you couldn't see the building. It was completely covered with bushes and small trees. <laughs> so we had to cut it all up. There was, a, there was a period of about six years that I didn't use the observatory and that was in the late, uh, between about 2000 and Four and 2012. Because um, I went to full observer again in 2003, I bought a 10 inch knob and uh, was just using that for, for uh, almost a decade. And it didn't, it didn't need to be in the observatory, it's my mobile scope, it's really easy to set up. And then, uh, so the team here that's, that I had a picture of them is uh, a gentleman from Cal uh, Canada on the left. He was my foreman for doing the renovation, uh, a friend of mine. And then, um, I don't remember all the names, but I had Gary Phillips on the right, uh, Jason's my son-in-law, and me, and I don't remember the name of the gentleman in, in between there. And then Dale, uh, Dale, um, uh, Timmy, yeah, he, he came out uh, the next day or the next weekend and helped me with this pier. We had to get, uh, uh, several, uh, a lot of sand out of that pier. I had silica sand in there. We had to get it all out of there so I could take that pier out. And the purpose of doing this whole renovation, as you can see, I had a, a uh, wedge down here for the LX200 still on the pier. But the whole purpose of this renovation was to get back to um, a, a large system in there, and that system was the 14-inch uh, dot that I picked up in 2012, which I still have. And that is, uh, I use that as a, my observatory as an observing platform again with this dot in there for uh, four years, actually. And then um, we went on to uh, this system here. In the fall of uh, 2016, I decided uh, it was time to get back into imaging. Um, I didn't tell anybody about this. I'd been planning it for three years, actually. And I ordered everything in October, and stuff started coming in November, December, and January. And I fired it up, took a few, few pictures, posted them, and people said, what are you doing, Doug? You said you'd never do imaging. Well, I got back into imaging. This is it. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't, you know, this is my third generation of imaging system, actually. I used to use the 8-inch F7 and the 12-and-a-half-inch F6 to do uh, something that everybody forgets, you know, the younger people, that we used to do this on film. And uh, that's why some of the images that you looked at from earlier pictures were not so great. They were standing off a of slide film. But anyhow, this is a 10-inch uh, F8 uh, Richie Cradian. 
and uh, it's on a Lasmani G11 mount, and I have a guiding system on it, and uh, I will describe that a little later. But the first question, yeah, my telescope fell over. I may need to get a new telescope. I started looking at truss tubes. Those things now cost in the neighborhood of a hundred and fifty thousand to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Go to go to and you're looking at the CDKs though, aren't you? Okay. I guess, yeah. You're looking at the Dalt Kirkland's. If you go to the RCs, this GSL ten inch costs um, it was three grand when I bought it. I think they're really? I think they're twenty eight hundred dollars now. But go to High Points Scientific and look up their GSO RCs. You can get a 10, 12, 14, or 16, depending on the mount that you have. This is just a simple 10. The reason I went with a 10 was I wanted to be able to transport it to Boone for long weeks uh, with a G11 mount. If I got anything bigger, I wasn't going to be able to haul it. I, I just physically wouldn't be able to deal with it. So that's why I went with a 10 inch. Plus, the focal length's nice, it's about 2,000 mm. So, it's in the old observatory. Well, the story behind this observatory has been up there 35 years. The last two winters, I struggled to push that roof open because if you notice the size of the roof, mm -hmm. right, it's got 36 inch walls on the top, mm -hmm. plus all those shingles and all that mm -hmm. plywood, etc. It weighs about a thousand pounds. For me to push it, as long as those wheel bearings, or those uh, needle bearings on the wheels were nice and smooth, I could push it. And as long as it stayed on the steel rails, I could push it. As soon as you put 500 pounds of snow on it, I can't push it. So the last two winters, I couldn't use the observatory. Uh, in addition, the old outriggers were warping. And so the angle iron that's on the outriggers, that were the guides for the wheels, were warping out, so they wanted the tendon to fall off the angle iron. Once it did that, I had to go out and get underneath it with the crowbar and put it back on. My wife said, I don't want you doing that anymore. Because one day I'm going to find you pinned by that thing when it falls down. I says, okay, well, I'll have to build a new one then. <laughs> <laughs> one with a motorized roof. That doesn't weigh so much. That's easier to use. But the first thing I got to do is tear the old one down. So that's what this is about here. And I should be able to start this up. So here's a four minute video of the tear down of the two observatories. We had to tear the old uh, white one down too. So we'll just go through that. I wonder if that started or not. Did you cry, shed any tears? And took this no, one? no. It was so happy you were getting the new one, right? He didn't cry. I'm nearly shedding it here. Get 
Well, you can at least roll it over there some ways, or set it, or carry, or carry it. It'll, it'll break apart. It'll Watch out, Gary. Watch out, guys. This can fall in the direction. I don't know what up your way. The spring's going to break. Demonstrating why I never built an observatory. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to destroy this one again. to arrange some kind of winch like they put on a jeep to pull, you know, you pull cars out of ditches oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. with the winch. Oh, yeah. I thought about even keeping it and putting a power uh, power system on it. Uh -huh. But I, when you evaluate the quality of the of 35 year old wood, yeah. you have to say, you have to decide uh, is, this, is this thing going to fall on me one day or not? And it was it was in a state of, of, of disrepair. I mean, four by four, one well, nice four by four, only lasts so long. Thirty five years is pretty good, actually, and that's what it was on. <clears throat> now, the teardown is done. We have to build a new one. There's no audio with this. This is a crew from Backyard, EU, uh, Backyard Observatories out of Ohio. I hired them to build this observatory on top of the existing 10 by 10 foundation that I had. So we only tore the old one down just to the floor. And then they built from that point up. Hey, look how fast they work. They, were, <laughs> they did this whole thing in four minutes. They were on speed. Did you price steel frame? Is it much more expensive? No, I didn't price it. What I did was I hired somebody that's been building these for, for years. He's been going around the country. I, I'm, this is build number 269 for him. I mean, it's either 267 or 269. But in any case, he's done a lot of them. And so he, uh, when I watched them do this, they, you know, all the engineering had been done long ago. They knew exactly what they needed to do. So he is probably already. Priced. It's sociological. So he's done this for this one company for 260 
people are, are owners. Yeah. There are that number of people just for this firm who have their own observatory. Correct. There's something really important here that you're noticing as it gets closer to being used, there's more clouds. <laughs> 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 Are you doing anything you think to make the wood last longer than versus your other observatory? If it lasts 35 years, I don't care. <laughs> I, I would be 97. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be painting uh, the outriggers, even though they are uh, um, lumenized. I'm going to paint them. Uh, this spring. In fact, I'm having an open house slash painting party in May. I figure it'll take us about an hour and a half to paint the, all the trim work and, and the outriggers and the poles. What did they charge you to do it? Um, with the range remained silent, I suggest you do so. It, it, was, it was more than a few dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Astronaut. The, uh, the uprights, the uh, four by fours, were they set in cement again? Yeah. Actually, those are six by sixes. Or six by sixes, okay. Yeah. But just, I, just putting cement around the foundation? No, they put, they put in um, footers first, and okay. set them on top, and then filled it in with cement. This is, you can remove the roof. With so that's the motor for the that's roof? That's the drive system, yeah. Uh, I have a couple of pictures. That's the crew, uh, Scott and his wife, and his uh, partner. Oh. They, uh, they did all the work. Cool. I just took the pictures. The interesting thing about the uh, system here is, you see those three brackets on the side? Those are angle iron that go like this. There's three on each side. They're overlapping angle iron that's just above them all the way out the entire running. The entire run from the end. That's a beautiful scallop. South end to the, to the north end. That's what they call the passive hold down. So it's never going to lift in wind or anything. It, the wheels are running on inverted angle iron and beads. So, so there's angle iron on the top runner, there's angle iron on the side, and then there's capture plates that keep the roof from lifting. And I'll just demonstrate the, uh, actually it'll be audio on this. It's not, it's not quiet. <laughs> And it's not fast, but it's, it, I only need to do this. Instead of pushing, I just need to push the little button now instead of pushing this big thing. So it's it's very nice. In fact, I can. There's an option I can get if I want to to control that motor as well via my software line that I have. So I can have it as part of the observing run to shut down and plug it up and close. I haven't decided whether I want to spend the money on that. If you want to know the pricing for backyard observatories, go to the website. Okay? That's my answer to your question about how much it costs. Well, that's nice. Does it come with heat? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's solar heat. You open up the sun. <laughs> Very nice. So that's the rebirth of the, of the uh, yeah, Northern Cross Observatory. Cool. And we all fit in it. <laughs> it's 10 by 10. You know how many we got in the bills? We got, what did we get in the bills? I don't remember that. It was like 13 or 15. Yeah, we had to pack us in though. 16, 16. 16, 16 we got in there? 16. I, have, I have a video of that too. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, my YouTube channel has like 200 and some videos. So anyways, this is what it looks like from looking north with the uh, fold down south wall. The fold down allows me to get more southern horizon, and which is important with a German equatorial mount because as you go south, the scope is actually getting lower, you know, when you're in this position. Yeah. So that's what the fold down roof is about, or a full, a wall is all about. I had them uh, rotate the uh, uh, roof 90 degrees so I have a good shot at Polaris for polar alignment. And, uh, and the door opens out. Nice. This is the trucks that were used, that they built. As you notice the wheels on there are V-block wheels. They each are rated to 800 pounds a piece. 
so I'm not going to worry about them breaking. And how much this, does the roof weigh? How much? This roof probably weighs about a, a, a 150 pounds, maybe 200 at the most. Way less than my own. Well, well, it's got a metal metal roof too. Well, the good thing about the metal roof is the snow slides off of it. That was the other problem I had with the old one. I had, a, I had this 25 foot rake <laughs> that I put on the old roof, tried to get a foot of snow off of it, and that sometimes worked. Um, but the way this is, is a rack of pinion basically, motor drive. So four, four and a half horsepower, I think it is. And uh, the uh, rack is, runs the length of the, of the roof. And then there's a small pinion that just keeps rotating around. And the other side just follows with it. This is looking southwest um, in the observatory with the uh, 10 inch. This is looking north from inside. The current system is, now this is where I'm going to get into some details. The current system is this 10 inch F8 Ritchie Creighton. It's uh, currently about 2010 uh, millimeter focal length as measured by uh, my uh, uh, plate solving software. I use plate solving software everywhere now. It measures the uh, size of your frame, tells you where everything is. It tells you what the pixel size is, etc. So I have a lot of data associated with that. So I lost my G11 with the Gemini 2 control system. I have a Pole Master camera for polar alignment, which I only use uh, once here, and then I use it when I go traveling, like up to Boom. I can set up the set up polar alignment in five minutes, so it's really very convenient. Uh, the ADSI 071 MC camera is a one-shot color. It's the size of a Canon T3i chip, an APS-C size chip, so it's a good size, 28 millimeter on the diagonal. Um, it has 4.87 micron pixels. The, it's 23 by 17 millimeter in the frame itself, and it has a cooler on it, so I can run it to 30 degrees below ambient temperature, uh, which right now I don't even bother with. Last night, or last week, I was out, it was, uh, Minus, I know, last a month ago it was minus 14 out there. I didn't even turn the cooler around. So, and then um, I have a Lodestar uh, 2 guide camera, which is uh, what I use to do my auto guiding. And for those that don't know what that is, is you use that to track on a star, sampling every two to four seconds, and bumping what they call a pulse guide to the mount just a little bit to keep it centered. It normally tracks slightly like early, which means it does a really pretty, pretty good job, but it'll take out the little imperfections in the gearing system. So that's what the audio guide, guide does. It's a closed loop system to, to uh, uh, keep the uh, camera on, on the target precisely. Um, and I'm using an on-axis guiding port. The uh, on-axis guiding port is something that most people don't use. They use either a secondary uh, a small refractor with a guiding camera or they use an off-axis guiding device, which looks at the perimeter of the primary uh, on a scope. You have your primary camera and then your off-axis camera. Well, the on-axis system, the guiding camera can see the entire field of view that the main camera sees, because it's essentially targeted. This unit right here, that's the guide camera. And the way, the way that works is, I'm going to go into that in a little more detail here, but the way that works is the on-axis guiding port has a, night, a, a diagonal in it. And it's got a dielectric uh, coating that allows 700 nanometer or greater near infrared straight through to the guide camera. And the white light is reflected out to the imaging camera. So both, both cameras are looking at the same field of view. And it allows me also to use the guide camera as a focusing system to keep it all automatically focused. As you can see, the uh, red camera is my main uh, imaging camera. It's got a USB uh, hub on it as well, so I can plug other cameras into it with a single USB cable coming out of it, uh, off, off the scope itself down up here. And then the guide camera is the black tube uh, that does all the guiding. 
Here's a picture of the uh, main uh, camera. That's the size of the chip there you see on the left. It's a good size chip. It's a 16 megapixel uh, camera. And on the back is the cooler with the fan and the USB ports. And then there's a power plug for running the uh, cooler, which I, I plug in as well. This is the focusing system I bought from Optech. It's computer controlled. It has an Ethernet. I can either run it via Ethernet or USB. I prefer to run it as an Ethernet device. It allows me to control the focus with my automatic focusing system. It just, excuse me, it just manages that uh, the focus through the night. I don't have to worry about temperature. The temperatures will change and the focus will change, but I don't use a what some people use as a uh, a temperature table for the characterization of of the uh, change in focus. I just use the real-time display of the guide uh, camera star to keep focus. This is the system with uh, my 4-inch Schmidt cast piggybacked on it and my Canon T3i camera, which gives me a little wider field. It's only 1,000 millimeter versus 2,000 millimeter. And again, that Canon is an APS-C type chip. And you can see in the corner there, my laptop that runs the entire system, I have M27 sitting on there. <laughs> Just another camera setup with a tele telephoto lens on it only, the 300 millimeter. These are optional things that I, I do. And then this is the communications protocol that I have set up. I have an observatory computer that runs the entire system. I can walk away from it once I set the automation up and it runs. I can go in the house and remote desktop to it so I can just have the display and controller from the house if I want, which is how I've done when I'm doing it interactively. It keeps me warm in the winter and out of the mosquitoes in the summer. And uh, it's basically an Ethernet router that the computer hooks into. The telescope is a G uh, Ethernet enabled. The focus is Ethernet enabled. And then I have a device called a GS600, which is, takes USB in and Ethernet out, so everything's off the Ethernet router. And I just connect. If I lose connection from the house, no big deal, it still is running. Now we'll move on to Boone. And I'll have some more details about the engineer. Boone Hill, um, four, four, five years ago, 2014, I decided to uh, put a permanent facility up there. It's up near west of Cadillac. And that's a 24 by 24 building, and it is uh, both a observatory type, doesn't open up, but it holds telescopes, which we will roll out. It's also a place to sleep, a place to keep warm, a place to cook stuff in a microwave, etc. So it made it a lot more convenient to drive up there. And This is with the 18 inch out, and actually the 25 is over the left, and you can't see it because it's too dark. And um, two Octobers ago, I took my imaging system up there as well. I just run it like that, uh, remote as well from inside the building. That's an example there. And then this you is. You lifted that up by yourself? Not the whole thing, it comes apart in pieces. <laughs> yeah, I know, the optical train. Oh, yeah, it. yeah, yes, I did. It weighs 34 pounds. The, the is that all? What? Yeah. The optical system weighs 34 pounds. Yeah. Too heavy for you, Gary, though. It's only 34 pounds. I have the body of a Greek god. Yeah. Right. Well, then you, you should be able to lift it with one hand. No, I, I would think it would be much heavier. But it's, it's all, it's trust you, and it's all covered in fiber. Oh. That looks a lot like my Star Master. Yeah. Is it a Star Master? What, the one on the, the right? Yes, it is. It's an 18 inch Star Master. Well, the mirror on my Star Master is 40 pounds. And it's only 14 and a half inch. Oh, that, that, that sucker weighs a lot more than 34. Oh, okay. The, 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 the OTA we're talking about is the one over here. That tube assembly is 34 pounds. He says that's a tiny lead light. What size? 10 inch? Does that include the mirror? Yeah. Yeah. That 10 inch RC out of the box is 34 pounds. It's amazing. That's, that's, that's another reason why I haven't got that. Instead of the 12, the 12 was 54 pounds. Now I was pushing it, you know, this old man isn't going to be able to lift that over his head to put it on the mound. So that's another reason I got the 10. It's only 34 pounds. The mound had 
without the counterweights or anything else, that weighs another 35 pounds. Just the, the equatorial hill. Yes. Yeah, So at Moon Hill, this is our assortment of telescopes that we have there, minus the one on the right. That was up there for a few months when uh, um, Ron, jeez, I'm going to get forget names. Uh, Ron, Ron had his, uh, his 18 up there for a while. But the, the 25 and the 18 on the left are uh, there, and the 10-inch and the 5-inch are there. So that's the collection we have up there at Moon Hill. What is, so, the, what is the mirror way on that 18 inch Star Master? I don't know. But the cage that it comes out of, you know, the Star Masters have their mirror built into that cage. You just put that in another. That's got to be, that's got to weigh 50 pounds. Okay, easily. Just, just the cage and the mirror that's in it. Um, so that's, that's the Boone Hill site, which uh, I go up several times a year. In fact, I'm going up possibly at the end of this month. Is that in Michigan? Yeah, it's west of Cadillac. It's near Bill's place. Yeah, about nine miles from Bill's place. And that was built in 2014, and we've been out there a lot um, over the last five years. What, say, tell me a little bit about that 25 inch. That 25 inch is a F5 Obsession brand. Rich brands his scope, it's his scope. And so he leaves it out there. He lives in Cadillac. That's why I have his. He's, I've known him since the 90s. And but how, anyhow, how does that transport out? How do you get it out of that building? It's pretty big stuff. See that door on the left over there? Okay. But I mean, you break it down? It's no. It's a six foot door. Yeah. Standard double door. You lift it on the wheelbarrow handles and it's you roll it out. Yeah, okay. So they're always set up. You just roll them up and set them on, <laughs> set them on, on, on the bricks and then go. That's why it's convenient. How cool. So the building doesn't move, but the scopes do. <laughs> and you, you actually have to climb up a ladder to look at oh, yeah. objects, right? When oh, they're... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. The 18 is not so bad. It's one step up. It's like right here. Okay. The 18 inches. And it's an F4.3. So it's right here. I can some, most of the time I don't need a step up, but when it's at zenith, I, I, need, I need to get on one step to look at it. The 25 has just got a 10 foot ladder, I think. So. Yeah, I'm writing a science fiction story, and part of it was. Objection. <laughs> okay, so a few results. I'll listen. Oh, this is a, a time lapse. The other thing I do, I wasn't going to talk about it much, but this is a opportune time. So I do time lapse photography as well, as you saw with the building of the observatory. But I do a nighttime uh, uh, a time lapse up at Boone. Yeah. And so I'll start up a, a session at, dawn, at dusk and let it run the entire night until dawn. Well, this happens to be six hours of uh, time lapse combined in a piece of software called Star Trails to generate the Star Trail. Yeah. So that's one night's worth of, or six hours worth of uh, data acquisition there. That's one thing. And that's at Boone, looking more obviously. How many, how many minutes per frame are you doing? 16 seconds per frame. 16 seconds per frame? Yeah. Wow, that's good. And then um, I combine them all. I combine yeah. six hours worth, so it should be, what, four? Oh, what is that? That's 900, 950 frames. Yeah. Um, another thing I like to do is uh, uh, go after comments. I like doing that a lot. That last night was clear. I, Photographed three more comments last night. Um, but these are just examples of two. I've got 15 comments that I've captured on uh, the system uh, in the last 18 months. And I'll continue to do that. That's Lovejoy, and that one is, uh, I think, we're 10. Uh, eclipses or, or lunar uh, events. Uh, uh, the one on the left is just a near full moon, not quite full moon. The one on the right is uh, the lunar eclipse during totality uh, back in January. That was great. These are both of the 10 inch. Now, with this 10 inch, I can't fit the entire moon in there. <laughs> okay? It doesn't quite fit. Especially during the full moons we have right now where it's near perigee. Yeah. There are 33 arc minutes. 
I've only got 27 arc minutes of, of field view of the y axis. So what I have to do is take this, bump it over, take another one, and then I mesh them together. Okay, so this is actually a composite. Or a, 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 a composite. Any what folder? software are you using? I get to that. To merge them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, in, in the case of the, of the stacking of the loader stuff, I'm using um, uh, Auto Stacker three. Or no, I'm not using that. I'm using Auto Stitch. Auto Stitch two to stitch a, stitch a multiple frames together after I process them. Um, this is just some examples through the ten inch. It's uh, the Whirlpool M51 on the left, the Crab Nebula here on the right, and the horse head down below. These are all with a 10 inch. So <laughs> now, you can do lots better than this. I consider these intermediate average quality. I've seen these guys in the astrophotography community that take 12, 20, 80 hours worth of data for one object. These are on the order of three hours, an hour and a half, two hours, okay, with the 10 inch. Some more, we have the Trifid up here, and um, NGC 3628 or the Hamburger Galaxy in Leo. Disgusting. And this one here is 30 minutes, this Trifid. It's only 30 minutes. The Hamburger one is uh, probably three or four hours. I don't have the data in front of me. Uh, M81, M82, and then you see 891. Here's the Flame Nebula. That's um, Almatac up there up top that's burning into the frame. That's how close it is in the, in the belt of Orion. The other thing I do is supernova stuff. Uh, this is uh, Supernova 217 EAW, and I've only got 12 minutes left, so I can move along here. Um, 6946, there was, a, there was a supernova in May of 2017 that was discovered. I decided to start photographing it, so I photographed it for almost a year. Um, but as you notice on the left, the uh, little yellow points to the supernova, and on the right, it's almost gone. Yep. By uh, the uh, uh, May of uh, 2018, it was complete. I couldn't even detect it on any of my data. So I do that as well, track uh, supernovas. Uh, here's a, because I was doing so many images of this, this galaxy, I decided uh, last year to stack everything that I did <coughs> over, over the year. And this ends up being 12 hours of data on the Fireworks Galaxy, 6946. Uh, this is the Deerlick group on the lower right and Stefan's Big Ted on the top left. The other thing I do is once I take an image of an area, I do a plate solve on it to see what other galaxies are, are in the field view. And as you notice, there's, there's several in here on the lower right hand corner. And then um, this is the Perseus, Perseus cluster, uh, otherwise known as Perseus A, Perseus A which is uh, centered on. NGC 1275, and look at the plates all on that. Wow. There's over 50 galaxies in that field of view. Wow. This is this is Doug Box Deep Sky's photo. <laughs> deep field photo. <laughs> I may take some more of that and add it to it. Great for three hours. That was three hours of data, yeah. Here's a, a small portfolio of the work I've done in the last year and a half or two years. Moon, uh, nebulas, galaxies, comets, etc. Nice. I wanted to get to the tools before I run out of time. I've got 10 minutes. Um, processing tools that I use are Deep Sky Stacker, PixInsight, GIMP2, and things like um, Auto Stacker, uh, Auto Stitch 2 for some of the looter stuff. Um, but most of my work is DSO, so it's Typically, Deep Sky Stacker does the stacking. I do no processing other than stacking because it's quick and easy. It'll take up my target frames and do, do those fine. Is and Deep pick, Sky Stacker free or do you have to pay for it? It's free. It's free. Huh? Yeah. Fix Insight, though, is expensive, but it is a fabulous tool for doing everything else. In fact, I can do stacking in Fix Insight. It's just more tedious than Deep Sky Stacker. That's the only reason I use DSS. 
And then give two is if I want to do any cosmetic cleanups like dust, dust donuts or something that I haven't gotten rid of with slats. The control and auxiliary software is a sequence generator pro that manages the entire automation process. What I do with that is I will download from a DSO browser online. I will download my observation list for the night. Might be 10 galaxies. I download straight into the SG Pro. It has all the coordinates for, for that sequence. So I have all 10 objects. I uh, set my camera for the uh, gain that I want, and I start it up. It plate solves, or it solves to the object, plate solves, centers it, takes the picture for whatever time domain I want, and then moves on to the next one. It does exactly the same thing. It moves to the next one. The auto guys, it, does, it turns the auto guide around automatically, etc. If it needs to do a meridian flip, it calculates when it's, if it can, has enough time to do the next frame. If it doesn't, it will meridian flip, center, plate solve, center, and continue on. Fully automated. I can start this up at 8 o'clock tonight, go to bed. It will collect 10 galaxies. It will be clear tonight. That's what I, my goal was, to automate the process. Um, I use PhD2 for guiding, auto guiding. Uh, Focus Lock is a tool that looks at the auto guiding star, makes a decision whether it needs to change the focus, and controls the focus. And then Sky X, I just use for ad hoc slewing. So say, oh, I'm going to look at that. I'll slew the object, take a snapshot, and, uh, or maybe take a couple of pictures of a particular area. I use the sky for the comments because the movement uh, from night to night, I have to basically download the minor planet center data for any given comments. And I, so the sky knows where it's at. I click on it, slew to it, and I'll take 30 minutes. Um, estimated integration time to date over the two years is about 250 hours of data I've collected with this system. The process, again, open the roof, power up the UPS, which is an uninterruptible power supply. I want clean power to all the electronics. Uh, run SG Pro, which selects, um, I, collect, I just connect to all the equipment, which you say select it all, and it brings every, powers everything up. It's all, all ready to go. I slew to a star to make sure I'm, my star model is good. I'm almost always within five arc minutes of the fundamental star because I'm in an observatory. And I just center it and sink on it. And then I open my multiple object sequence and start it, and then I go to bed. <laughs> and it runs the entire night and parks in the uh, morning. If a cloud comes over, I, I only let it auto automatically run if I know it's going to probably be clear all night. I will not risk rain or snow or something like that. Yeah. So I look at the weather, you know, 40, 40 hours out. If it's going to cloud up at like 10 o'clock in the morning, but there's no projected rain, I'm good. Um, but if it loses a guide star because of clouds, it goes into a recovery mode for 90 minutes. In fact, I did it this morning. I ran this thing last night. I collected eight objects last night. Um, but the recovery mode started at about 4 o'clock because the clouds are coming in. And it tries to reacquire every five minutes for about an hour and a half. If it doesn't, it finally parks the system and shuts down everything. So I got up at 7.30, I looked out there, it was parked, sure, no rolls. I also have an I, a, 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 a IP camera, a, a, a near infrared, or I mean, a night vision camera in the observatory so I can see the scope itself in case it decides to go out to lunch. Or the bear that's tending to it. For me? Or the bear that's tending to it. <laughs> the bear. <laughs> yeah. So in the morning, I make a coffee, a coffee, close up the roof, start data transfer into the house via Wi Fi, and start processing last night's data. In fact, I processed five of the eight objects I got last night and worked on all day today. I, I, I catalog everything I do. These are all the objects. This is one page out of about 12 pages. Um, object, data, uh, data collection started, number of frames, exposure time, that's total integrations calculated, the gain I use. The temperature at the time of the camera and then the camera I use. So that's my data collection that I do the next day. Put down everything that actually occurred. And I, I've been recording that since January of 2017. Do you have to do that by hand or some software? No, I do that by hand. But I have all the data though. It's, 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 in, the, uh, it's in the FITS file. The file that's generated got all this data and I have what, tons more data that's automatically there, including all the values that I just. So my references for uh, for your uh, 
pleasure, if you so desire, is I have a Flickr, I have a Flickr account that has some of my images on it. Just look up Doug Bach on Flickr. Oh, don't move it. Uh, Boone Hill website is my web page, and then I have a, a Facebook page. It's a personal Facebook page, and <coughs> Boone Hill, an NCO discussion group, and then I have a, a Norwood Cross Observatory page. And uh, these these will be posted on my uh, Boone Hill discussion page, so you get to this presentation. Questions? Uh, yeah. Do you have any of the videos of the comments? Yes, I do, but I don't think we have time. Okay. We don't. What do you mean by plate solid? All right, so what the software does is it, it'll take the images you took, and it tries to match it with the uh, global database that the NPC uh, or JPL or whoever's got. There's many databases that have all the objects in the, in the sky. It will try to match it up automatically once it matches the area and the sizing, it will label all the galaxies that it sees in your picture. Oh and that's, that's what I did, right? for annotating it. For plate solving for centering, it does the same thing, but it knows exactly where the coordinates are and, and it matches it, that, that global database to say, well, it should be right here. And right now you're a little bit off, so I'm gonna bump your scope over a little bit. We take another sample, check it, and now you're centered. So I don't even have to, I don't even have to model the mount. I can do everything with plate solving because it'll automatically center it for me, even if I didn't model them out. So this system doesn't need you. Exactly. See, while it's running, I can pull my other scope out and observe it. So, which is what I do at part. Um, the whole point, the part that I took place in was I'm a, as my career in Ford Motor Company, I built real-time solutions like this. We close them up. So this was a no-brainer for me. And it was fun doing it because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew all the components I wanted. And I built it and it worked the first time. That was what was the whole thing about it. And uh, it was fun. And that was the part that I played, building it. Any One questions? more question. Go ahead. Have you ever come close or thought you'd come close to picking off a type 1A supernova? No. No? Not yet. Not yet. The other thing is, the system also air corrects. If I get a gust of wind and the tracker goes out past two, two to three uh, pixels, SG Pro throws it away and starts over on that frame. Because huh. I got it set up, I've got the error bar set up so that if it goes over two pixels, that's that's going to be a bad frame. Just toss it and start up, start that frame again. So by the time I'm done, I have 100% good data. Okay. The only thing that would screw the data up is I get a airplane through or clouds kind of roll in and mm -hmm. give you some background in the sky that's, that shouldn't be there. So I, I'm getting literally, I would say 98% of the frames I gather are good. Oh, you don't lose track when the clouds come in? Yeah, and I'll throw that one away. I'm saying by the time I transfer it in the house, that frame is gone. It, if it's two minutes into a five minute exposure and I lose the guide star, and I get more than two pixels variation, plus or minus. Uh -huh. SG Pro says this one's going to be bad. I'm going to toss it and start. Okay. Now all you have to do is wire the roof up. Yep. So that it shuts automatically. That's what I keep telling my wife. I'm telling my wife, says, I'm getting tired of getting, having to put my clothes on at seven o'clock in the morning. And go <laughs> <laughs> it can be rough going out to do your business too. You know. Thank you very much.